In today's lecture, we are going to talk about macromolecules. We will start by reminding you what macromolecules are. We talked about that in the previous lecture. We will then talk about monomers and how they can be combined together to make polymers. And that will be important for all of the macromolecules we are discussing. We will then talk about amino acids, which combine together to form polypeptides or proteins. And finally, we will talk about lipids. These are three of the four categories of macromolecules. The fourth category is nucleic acids, and this is what DNA is made out of. We will return and talk about nucleic acids later in the semester. So as we just specified, there are four categories of macromolecules. Those are carbohydrates, amino acids, which form proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, which form DNA. Macromolecules generally are large carbon-based molecules. So these are going to be strings. They could be strings with as few as three subsections, but oftentimes they will have thousands or more subsections all connected together. And they're always going to be connected together. Um, at least usually they're going to be connected together in long chains. There are some times when they get connected into something more like a sheet. All of our macromolecules are going to be formed by starting with monomers and connecting them into polymers. So the monomers are the smallest repeating units, and the polymer is a chain of those monomers. As we just said, it can be up to thousands of monomers long. And so here's what it looks like in the diagram. We have a monomer down here. Maybe this is one amino acid, or maybe it's a single glucose. And then it gets connected or added to another monomer, maybe a second glucose or a second amino acid. And then once linked, we have the start of a polymer. Usually we use the term polymer for things that are more than two. Here we have only two. But if you imagine this happening again, then we would have a third one, a fourth one, etc and it would count as a polymer. And so here's an analogy. If we think of a train as being a series of cars, then each one of these cars in the train is the monomer. And once we have them all linked together, it's a polymer. Now, as we build cells and we build structures in cells, it's going to be important to take our monomers and link them together because the polymers are either going to be more useful for storage or they are going to be useful for actually achieving tasks. For example, doing something like um, an enzyme um, would help a chemical reaction to occur. So in much of what we worry about is how monomers can be linked into polymers. The reverse process, though, is also important because there are times when we need to take a polymer and break it back down into monomers. An example of this that we will get to is that we can store glucose, which is used for powering um, reactions in the cell. We can link those together and store it as starch. And that's good for storing it, but then when we actually need that energy to do something, we would have to be able to break those glucose molecules off. And so each of those glucose molecules could be used to power cellular reactions. So this can go in both directions then. And while we're talking about glucose, let's transition and talk about carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are one of our four major groups of macromolecules. The monomers of carbohydrates are sugars. And sugars are always going to be made from exactly three elements. Those three elements are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And not only are carbohydrates always made by these three elements, they're always made with the same ratios of these three elements. So every carbohydrate has the same amount of carbon as oxygen. And there's always twice as much hydrogen 
as there is carbon or twice as much as oxygen. That means we can write a general formula for any carbohydrate. It should follow this. If n is the number of carbons, let's say, oh, there's a mistake here, let me correct it before we talk about it. Okay. If n refers to the number of carbons, then we always have the same number of oxygens. So if we have, let's say, n equals 6 would be common for something like glucose, then that would mean we'd have 6 carbons. We would also have n equals 6 here, so we would have 6 oxygens, and we would have 2n, or 6 times 2 is 12, so we would have 12 hydrogens. If n equaled 5, then we would have 5 carbons, 10 hydrogens, and 5 oxygens. The monomer of a carbohydrate is a monosaccharide. Saccharide basically refers to sugar, and the prefix mono means one. So anytime we have one unit, then it's going to be a monosaccharide. That's not the same as saying we have one carbon. For example, we have many important sugars, um, or at least multiple important sugars that have this formula, C6H12O6. In this case, the monomer is this molecule, um, and we'll talk about a couple of examples momentarily. And so this is going to be a six-carbon monomer. There's two six-carbon monomers that we will talk about. The first is glucose, and the second is fructose. Glucose is the most important because this is the direct product of photosynthesis. Whenever photosynthesis occurs, glucose is made, and then that glucose can be modified into other things. There's another six carbon sugar, so they both have the same formula as shown here, but the way the atoms are actually arranged is a little bit different between them. The second six carbon sugar we will worry about is fructose. And fructose is important in human diets because it is an abundant sugar in corn, and corn is a very cheap crop for us to grow relative to sugar cane. That means that many sweets um, are sweetened with high fructose corn syrup instead of sugar. So if you look through the ingredients of whatever dessert or candy you bought most recently, you'll probably see high fructose corn syrup on the list. Again, the monomer C6H12O6. There is one five carbon sugar that's going to be important that we'll talk about later in the semester, but since we are talking about monosaccharides now, I will mention it. And this is, um, it's five carbon, so it's gonna have the formula C5H10O5, and the specific version of this that we'll be interested in is deoxyribose. And this is important because this is what gives us the letter D in DNA. We'll see that DNA is deoxyribose nucleic acids. And one part of this molecule is going to be this five carbon sugar. For now though, let's go back and let's focus on the six carbon sugars, glucose and fructose. If we have monomers, we can link them together. And if we do, then we're gonna have two monomers linked we're going to call this a disaccharide. Di means two. Saccharide essentially refers to sugar. So again, this is two monomers in our sugar. And the most important disaccharide for our purposes is sucrose. Sucrose is table sugar. Um, and so that's pictured here. This is what you would put into coffee or into your baking um, or your sweet tea. And here's what it actually looks like. Sucrose is made out of one glucose being linked to one fructose. So when we eat this, of course it tastes sweet, um, but we want to get some energy from it. So for our bodies to be able to use this, the first thing we have to do is break the bond between the glucose and the fructose. And this can happen possibly in the stomach, or if not, then it will happen with enzymes in the small intestine. We will get a splice here. We'll divide those two 
or it will divide the disaccharide into the two monosaccharides, and we can then use the glucose or the fructose as sources of energy. So we just looked at the disaccharide, which had two units, but many times in the cell, instead of just having two units, we will have many repeating units. And if we have more than two, we can use the term poly. So if it's a sugar, it's going to be a polysaccharide. So a polysaccharide, I say, is a long chain of monosaccharides. But really, when I say long, it's just, to fit the definition, it has to be more than two. And we are going to talk about two important polysaccharides of glucose. The first of those is starch. We'll talk about what starch is first, and then we will talk about its importance. So starch is going to be long chains of glucose, and the particular form of glucose um, that's used results when they get connected into long chains. This long chain isn't going to stay straight. Instead, it's going to form a helix, as pictured down here. And that's important because by forming a helix, it can take a condensed shape inside our cell, and it won't take up much space and it won't have to interact very much with other things in the cell. And so that's good if something's in storage, you don't want it to be interacting. Then if we need the glucose out of the starch molecule, we can break off sections of it and to free up individual glucose molecules. So starch is gonna be important for storing energy. And there's many places in the plant where energy storage can occur. Um, it occurs to some extent in leaves. Um, it also occurs in fruit, usually not fruit that's ready to eat because it doesn't taste sweet and it's not easy for us to digest. But while the fruit is still ripening, it might store that energy as starch and then change it back to a simpler sugar um, as the fruit ripens. There's also a lot of starch in seeds. Seeds, remember, um, one of their important roles is storing energy in reserves for the plant that is going to germinate and start growing. And so it's not surprising that um, starch is present because starch is a great way of storing energy. We also will see starch stored in various underground structures, especially things like roots and tubers. And so we talked about these earlier in the semester. We said the tuber is a modified stem. Roots obviously are part of the root system but both can sometimes be used for storage. And here's an example. Potatoes are a kind of tuber. We specified that earlier in the semester, and they are filled with starch. In the laboratory exercise we'll do soon, you'll be able to see that. A second example is pasta. So pasta is made from wheat, and really what we're grinding up are wheat seeds. There's other things in those seeds too, but there's a lot of starch. And that's why you might eat um, pasta before a exercise event, like if you're a runner or other endurance athlete, then the night before you eat a big meal of pasta and you have all of that starch energy that you can then make accessible the next day. In a laboratory coming up, we are going to see if we can detect starch. And we're going to do that using something called the iodine test. Iodine is an orangish color, but when exposed to starch, it's going to turn to a deep purplish blue or even black color if there's enough starch present. And so you can see here, um, these are um, vesicles coming out of a wheat seed. So the seed was ground up. These are part of its cellular contents and iodine has been added. What you can see is that where iodine has started to go across the membranes inside these structures, we start to get this dark purplish color. That tells us that whatever is inside here, there must be some starch present. We'll do this looking at potatoes, and I'll ask you as well to choose some other plants to look at and see whether or not you can find evidence of starch storage. So glucose, one um, polysaccharide of glucose is starch. A second polysaccharide of glucose is cellulose. This is still a long chain 
of glucose, but this is a very slightly different form of glucose. Even though it's still glucose, this different form results in very different chemical properties. One difference is that chains of this form of glucose turn out to be straight. They do not form helices, they just form straight lines. And this will be important for a couple reasons. First, those straight lines allow us or allow plants to build long straight fibers composed of many of these lines lined up next to each other. And those are really useful for structural support. And so, for example, cell walls are filled with these straight lines of uh, um, cellulose going through them. And let me just connect, correct my spelling mistake there. Because cellulose is uh, very good at structural support, we find a lot of cellulose anywhere that this is necessary in a plant. For example, in leaves, um, in the cell walls, in stems of herbs, we find a lot of um, cellulose, and pretty much every other location in the plant as well. Um, the cell walls are going to be made mostly of cellulose. Another important property of cellulose is that something about the straight chains and the particular location of the glucose means that animals cannot digest it. So the plant can make cellulose, but we as animals cannot break it down. Why is this important? Well, this means it passes straight through our digestive system from one end to the other. In other words, it is part of the fiber component of what we eat. And if you read nutritional guidelines, you will see that eating fiber is recommended because it stimulates our digestive system, it helps material move through more quickly, and it might confer some benefits to uh, reducing our risk for various diseases. And so we can say generally that this fiber benefits our intestinal health. A problem with it is that we can't derive any energy from eating cellulose. So if you eat some food like celery that's largely composed of cellulose, then you might get some nutrition from it, but you're not going to get very many calories at all. Now, some animals, like this cow here, have figured out a way to, in fact, extract energy and nutrients from that cellulose. And they do it, with partnering, they do it by partnering with some gut microbes some bacteria that are able to break down cellulose into individual monomers. Once those bacteria make those monomers free, then the animal is able to use that energy and able to use the nutrients stored in it. Um, so this is an example of a symbiosis, um, kind of like we talked about with corals. This is a tight association between two different organisms, a bacteria and an animal in this case, where they both derive some benefit. So that's all we're going to say about carbohydrates. We're going to move on now and talk a little bit about proteins. Proteins serve a variety of different important functions in cells. And we'll talk about ones specific, or ones that occur in plants, but I'll also mention a couple that occur more in animals than plants. Um, so one role of proteins is to provide structural support um, in animals, but of course remember that humans are animals, so this applies to us too. So something like our cartilage is made largely out of protein, our bones have a large protein component, and our muscles are largely comprised of protein. Proteins also allow movement of animals, so, for example, since our muscles are protein and our muscles allow us to move, um, the proteins are really responsible for our ability to move. Since plants don't move in similar ways to animals, proteins are much less important for this role in plants. We'll talk about plant movement and how it occurs much later in the semester, but it's usually something based on changing the amount of water inside the plant material. So we'll leave that thought. A third function of proteins is storage. 
And so this is basically a way that if a plant knows it's going to need protein for something later, it can store it and then make it accessible at that time. And this is most especially important in seeds. It occurs in other places too, but that seed is going to turn into a developing plant that's going to need a lot of protein. That, that means that the parent plant packs a lot of protein in beforehand. Proteins are used for transport. This happens in a couple of different ways. One way is that cells oftentimes have to import material from outside the cell. They also have to move material around within cells. And finally, they have to sometimes send material out of cells. All three of these processes are going to largely be mediated by proteins either in the cell or in the cell membrane that surrounds the cell. And finally, but maybe most importantly, proteins are important because many, well, almost all enzymes are made out of protein. And a pro an enzyme is simply a protein that accelerates or speeds up chemical reactions. We have many important processes in our cells. If we focus on plant cells, they're doing things like photosynthesis and respiration and making new DNA and making proteins based on the information in that DNA. All of those processes and a whole slew of other ones are going to involve hundreds of chemical reactions and each of those chemical reactions is controlled by a different enzyme. So without those enzymes, the plant would be, able, be unable to do basic metabolism and would be unable to survive. Super important. So we had five things on our list here. Proteins are important for structural support, movement, at least in animals, storage, transport into, out of, and within cells, and for mediating chemical reactions as enzymes. That's what proteins do. Now let's talk about how they're made. The amino acid is the monomer of the protein. So a monosaccharide was the monomer of a carbohydrate. Amino acids are monomers for proteins. Instead of having just one in our chain, like we did for starch or for cellulose, for proteins, we are always going to have a mix of 20 different common amino acids. Each one of the amino acids, depending on its exact structure, has somewhat different chemical properties. And so the way that we get proteins that have different functions is by linking those 20 different forms of amino acids in different orders in long chains. I'm showing you here a chain of about seven, but a functional protein might have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of these amino acids. And in any protein of that particular type, their sequence is going to be exactly the same every time the plant makes it. So amino acids get assembled into long chains in a precise order. The name of this chain, as soon as we have three or more amino acids in it, we can call it a polypeptide. Peptide is just referring to the individual pieces, and poly again means many. So if a plant is going to make this long chain of amino acids in some exact order, such that it will have a protein for some particular function, it must have information stored somewhere about the order in which it should add these amino acids. As it turns out, the important role of DNA in our cells is to store that information about the order that different amino acids get added to each chain. So each gene is really a set of instructions that says add this amino acid first, and then this one, then this one, then this one, then another one of whatever this was, etc. So each of those 20 amino acids, as we said, has some different chemical properties. Those properties determine which amino acids each one 
is able to interact with and each one and with what other amino acids each one is repelled from. So let's just go back here for an example. Maybe this green amino acid is really attracted to the brown one and maybe it's repelled by the red one. If that's true, then if this chain were to fold, it would fold into a shape where this green one might end up folded over here near the brown one, but it would not end up folded over near the red one. And once we have a very long chain, then the net interactions between every amino acid and the others causes the chain to fold into some very particular shape. And so here we can see an example. This happens to be hemoglobin, which is an animal protein. But we can see that there's chains and that they are folded into some particular shape that happens to hold um, what's called a heme group. And this is where we can hold oxygen and move oxygen around in our blood. Now, what's important is that if we had some different amino acids somewhere in this chain, then because of their different properties, it would not fold in exactly the same way. And if it folded in a different pattern, then it might be much worse or even possibly better at holding onto the oxygen. And that would then change its ability to move oxygen around, pick it up and drop it off in appropriate locations in our bodies. So the order of amino acids is really important because it determines the shape and this shape is really important because it determines the enzyme's function. So now let's talk a little bit about how we as animals make proteins and why we need to eat um, proteins in our diet. Animals are able to make proteins, but we are not able to make amino acids. So we need to either ingest proteins or at least ingest amino acids such that we can make our own proteins. When I say we cannot make amino acids, that's technically true. We can't make them from scratch. There are some kinds of amino acids that we are able to modify into other types. We said there are about 20 types. So some of those we don't need to eat because we can take a different one and just change it into the one that we are lacking. For other ones, we cannot do that trick. So we are gonna to refer to some of our amino acids as essential amino acids. And these are ones that we cannot make by modifying some other one. These then are needed in our diet for us to survive and be healthy. So essential ones are required. They cannot be made by modifying. Conversely, non-essential amino acids are ones that can be made by taking some other amino acid and then in our bodies modifying it to the one that we are lacking. So if we were choosing food to eat based on their amino acid composition, we would want to favor foods that have lots of essential amino acids. We would be less concerned about making sure the food had the non-essential ones. So where does our protein come from? All protein in an animal's diet comes either directly from plants or indirectly from plants. And what do we mean by this? Well, first let's go back and say, where would we get protein in eating plants? There's gonna be some protein in any plant cell because all plant cells contain enzymes, for example. But some plant cells contain a lot more protein than others and seeds are the area where there's the most protein concentrated. That's because plants use seeds for storing the protein. And so some examples of things that we eat because they are high in plant protein. Um, grains, grains are very high in carbohydrates, but they're also high in protein. Beans are very important and nuts are very important. If we focus on many diets that are low in meat, we'll find that they have a mix of grains and beans. This would be true, for example, in Asian cooking, if you combined tofu and rice, and it'd be true in something like Mexican cooking if you combined beans and rice. A reason that this is important from a dietary perspective is that while these are both rich in proteins, 
they are relatively more rich in different essential amino acids. So by eating both of these, we can get the full complement of essential amino acids, and then we can modify some of those to make the other non-essential amino acids that we don't have as much of. So eating a mix of grains and beans is better than eating only grains or eating only beans. Unless you are a vegan, then some of your protein in your diet is coming from animals. Um, for example, meat is high in protein, eggs is high in protein, um, and dairy is high in protein. So it's true that some of our protein is coming from animals, but if we follow that protein backwards in time, we'll see that the animal products that we are eating um, those animals actually got those amino acids from eating plants. So here's an example. There are chickens that are eating grain. That grain contains protein. The chickens process it, and they use it to make their own proteins. And then if we eat eggs or if we eat chicken itself, we're eating their protein that came from amino acids from that grain. So ultimately, the plant protein is going to be our source of protein. We are not going to look at the specific structure of an amino acid, but we will specify that amino acids contain nitrogen. And this is why it's so important when we garden or when we farm to make sure that we have a ready supply of nitrogen in the soil. Um, with it, then the plants are able to make amino acids. There's only a couple of forms of nitrogen that plants are able to acquire. The two important ones are ammonium and especially nitrate. And so when we fertilize, what we're doing is we are adding ammonium or nitrate to the soil. And if you see a bag of fertilizer and it has three numbers on it, the first number is N. This is an indication of the amount of nitrogen available. We're going to move on to the third category of macromolecule that we'll talk about in this lecture. And this is lipids. So lipids we are going to define as nonpolar, energy-rich molecules. If lipids are nonpolar, then if you remember back to the lecture about atoms and molecules, remember that anything that is nonpolar wants to avoid water because water itself is a polar molecule. So because uh, lipids are nonpolar, they are going to not like water, they're going to be scared of it, and we will refer to them as hydrophobic. We can see an example of that, well, we'll look at this example momentarily. Let's first specify that two uh, kinds of lipids we've already talked about this semester. These are kudin and wax. And if you recall, both of these were used as part of the covering um, in the epidermis of plants. For example, we talked about it explicitly in the cuticle of leaves. We said that there was, um, we said the layer of, on top of the epidermis is the cuticle, and the cuticle is made out of kudin and wax. Now we can understand why that's a useful thing to put on the surface of a leaf. The kudin and wax are hydrophobic. What that's going to do is trap water inside the leaf and not let it leave. You can also see that if you take water and you put it on a leaf surface, it is not going to absorb inside the leaf. Because of that layer of kudin and wax, it cannot get through. It wants to get as far away from that kudin and wax as it can, and so it beads up, allowing all of these molecules at the top here to be as far away from the kudin as they can get. So, before we move on and talk about triglycerides, I'm just going to specify that kudin and wax are both going to be polymers of individual sections of lipid. So, and because they're polymers, they branch and connect to each other, which helps to create an entire watertight surface. Okay, now we will move on and we will talk about another important category of of lipids. These are triglycerides. <laughs>
and triglycerides are lipids that are used explicitly for storing energy. The prefix tri means three, like tricycles have three wheels. So triglycerides have three fatty acid tails. Diagrammatically, you can see a tail here, a tail here, and a tail here. And the chemical composition of these tails is very good for storing large amounts of energy. We said that carbohydrates were good at storing energy, but fats are even better at storing energy. This is why if somebody's dieting, they might choose to avoid fats because per unit, um, per gram of food, the fat is going to have a lot more calories in it than the carbohydrate. Now, I'm not actually giving that as diet advice. There are good reasons to think that despite that, there might be um, good reasons to keep fat in one's diet. But that's the logic that people use when they justify that decision. So let's come back to triglycerides and talk about fats and oils. These are the two common forms of triglycerides. And in them, we'll see that sometimes tails are saturated, sometimes tails are unsaturated. Let's take a look down here and see what this refers to. Over on the left, we see unsaturated tails. Over on the right, we see saturated ones. I want you to notice the unsaturated ones have kinks and bends. The saturated ones are straight. Hold that thought and we'll talk about it in the next couple slides. We will first talk about saturated fatty acids. Triglycerides that have saturated fatty acid tails are going to be solids at room temperature. When we say saturated, what we really mean is that they are saturated with hydrogen. In other words, they have as much hydrogen as possible. There's nowhere in those tails where there's the chemical possibility of attaching another hydrogen. When the tails are saturated, they are going to be straight. And this is important because triglycerides with straight tails are able to pack together more tightly. If they are able to pack together tightly, they're not able to move as much. And as a result, at room temperature, they are going to be solid. This is going to be true of most animal fats. So lard over here is an example of a saturated animal fat. Um, it is solid at room temperature. This would also be true for something like butter or bacon fat. Now we'll talk about what happens when we have unsaturated fatty acid tails. In this case, the fatty acids are going to be liquid at room temperature. And let's go through the logic of this. Um, so fatty acid tails that are not fully saturated, so they're in, other, in other words, they are unsaturated, that means that they are missing some hydrogens. There's somewhere where you could conceivably stick in another hydrogen atom. For reasons we won't talk about, when this is true, it's going to mean that the fatty acid tails are bent. And we saw that on this slide here. You can see those bends. And the effect of this is that you cannot pack the triglycerides as tightly together. Well, if they're more spread out, then they are more able to move. And when molecules are more able to move, then they go from being solids to being liquids. So lipids that have unsaturated tails are liquid at room temperature. And this is going to be true for most plant oils. Here's an example. We have olive oil, which is clearly a liquid. This would also be true for something like corn oil or canola oil. So we're going to move on from triglycerides. Remember, triglycerides had three tails. We're now going to um, move towards our finish by talking about phospholipids. And phospholipids are going to be really important because they form the cell membranes of um, both plant cells and animal cells. So you can see in this diagram, the phospholipid has two fatty acid tails, not three. And in each of these, the top of it we are going to call the head group. And the head group is going to be polar and attracted to water. 
these fatty acid tails, just like in the triglyceride, are going to be nonpolar and hence hydrophobic. They're going to want to stay as far away from water as possible. Remember that cells are filled with water, and so this will be important. The result of these properties is that if we take a whole bunch of fatty acid, or of phospholipids rather, and we put them into water, they will spontaneously form these membranes. And it's going to be what's called a double membrane. It's called double because we have one layer of phospholipids up here, we have a second layer down here. And in these two layers, the tails face into each other. That is going to occur because the tails don't like to be near water. And if this is a membrane in the cell, this says intracellular, so this is the cytoplasm. Remember the cytoplasm is largely made of water. And out here, outside of the cell, the cell is going to be in a bath that's also water, since our bodies are basically made out of water. And so either way, the tails want to get away from here and away from here. By lining up inside, they achieve that. Conversely, the head groups are hydrophilic and polar, so they like being near water. So they are going to spontaneously line up either near the extracellular fluid or down here inside near the cytoplasm inside the cell. This is going to create then a barrier around the entire outside of our cell that is going to control what can go in and what can go out. So I want to wrap up today by just giving you reminders about the three kinds of macromolecules we talked about and about macromolecules in general. So one generality is that all macromolecules are built by taking their monomers and combining them together into polymers. And that's really important for plants. Plants sometimes break these down too. For example, if they need to take stored proteins and use them to make new ones, they would have to take those stored ones and break them down into component amino acids. We do this in digestion. So when we eat plant material, for example, we are going to take those macromolecules and break the polymers back into monomers, like individual glucose molecules or individual amino acids, which we can then use to build things in our own bodies. Finally, each kind of macromolecule has its own important role. Carbohydrates, we said, are used for energy storage and structure, and we'll see later that one of the kinds of sugars is also part of DNA. Proteins are used for storage, transport, and enzymes in plants. They're used for these things in animals, and they're also used for structure and movement in animals. Lipids are used for energy storage, as well as waterproofing in plants. And we should add here, they're also used as phospholipids to make cell membranes in all living organisms. And finally, as we'll talk about later in the semester, Nucleic acids are the final category of macromolecules, and they include DNA, and they are used to store information. The next topic that we will talk about is going to still relate to chemistry. We're going to go back to our focus on water, and we're going to talk in much more depth about how water is able to move through plants from the soil to the roots to the stem to the leaves, and then finally out as water vapor into the air.